Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Tech Talk with the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. Today, we're going to be talking about the Lost Person Behavior Suite of Tools for Search and Rescue Efforts. We're very fortunate today to have s and Dr. Angela Irvin and Mr. Robert Kester from DBS yeah. Productions, one of s and partners. Thank you both for being here. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, so we're going to get things started, talk a little bit about the background, and then we'll answer audience questions. If you have a question, feel free to post it in the thread, and we'll get to it as we go through the video. Um, so let's just start by talking about the background for this project. Okay, so as you know, and, and maybe many in the audience know, the uh, focus of DHS s and is to fund research and development projects that develop solutions for our components and our customers' mm. requirements and needs. So this particular project resides in the first responder group, and in that group we focus on the first responders, some tools they might use to, you know, uh, make their operations more efficient or safer. So um, we know that on any given day in the United States, there are thousands of missing people's uh, reports, yeah. mis missing people cases. And along with those, then, there's going to be searches. Uh, one search strategy cannot fit all. People are different. People have different mental, physical capabilities. Mm -hmm. People are different ages. Um, therefore, the search strategies really have to be sort of tailored yeah. towards those categories. So in 2013, DHS S&T posted a SBIR, which is a small business innovative research announcement, asking the uh, you know private industry can you develop tools to help make search and rescue operations more efficient mm -hmm. more efficient uh, search and oper uh, search and rescue operations will decrease the time of the search and increase the likelihood of saving lives so Bob, uh, Doc, uh, Mr. Kester uh, was was the recipient of the SBIR award in that year very nice um, and Robert, can you tell us a little bit about this suite of tools? Because it's not just one thing necessarily. It sounds like there's a lot of resources available to first responders through this. Right. The, the initial tool I developed, uh, which I had a little bit before, was that the Lost Person Behavior Book. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people refer to that uh, as their Bible or, or go-to tool mm -hmm. uh, on most searches. Uh, the next thing I did was actually update uh, the database that, that goes into the book. Mm -hmm. And then with the updated database, I wrote another book called Endangered and Vulnerable Adults and Children that has the more up-to-date data. It also uh, provides the first responders with more checklists oh, okay. uh, to get through those initial stages uh, of a search. Uh, an another tool that was developed uh, for the person who wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning and just wants a, a quick reference mm -hmm. of what this subject is, is like is, okay, I'm looking for a missing hunter. Mm -hmm. Just a few brief sentences of characteristics of missing hunters. How far are they usually found away? Mm -hmm. Where are some of the lo likely locations they're actually mm -hmm. found? Uh, a lot of people keep this right by their, their bedside. And then they can also ro flip it around. Here's the initial actions mm -hmm. uh, to, to get your, your search going. Uh, another, then we have sort of three pieces of software mm -hmm. uh, that are, are available. Uh, one is an app uh, for your, your smartphone that essentially has all the contents of the book on your phone. Okay. So most people don't walk around with a book all the time, but we all walk around with our smartphones mm -hmm. uh, all, all the time. Uh, another one is once that the search is done, you want to collect, hopefully, uh, basic data on where the subject was found, how far away were they found, uh, what did this uh, lost person do while they were lost, and that's the data that goes into SARCAT, and mm -hmm. SARCAT is something that's freely available, and that then feeds back into the, the ISRI International Search and Rescue Incident Database mm -hmm. that I then write to develop products. And kind of the, the, the final product is, is going to be search management software. Okay. And that, that piece of software is called Find, and it integrates search mapping, mm -hmm. incident management, and search theory. So it sounds like it's, it's nice to have this suite of tools because not only does it help you at the beginning of a search when that time is really precious to, you know, making sure resources are allocated efficiently and right away, but there's also some 
resources for folks as you finish up this uh, process so that your information then can go on to help others and it sounds like this is constantly being updated so that as we gather more information this database being updated then can help other people who might find themselves in similar situations absolutely, absolutely. and I I think uh, something that Bob has really brought to the table is this expansion of this ISRI, mm. this database he's talking about. Um, setting you know, guidelines as to what type of data should be input, uh, changing it from an Excel format to more of a relational database. Oh, wow. These are important things and make it easier to use and he's, he collects this data nationally and internationally. So this isn't just a United States tool per wow. se. This is very broad reaching. I want to dig a little bit more into that database. Can you tell us a little more about the database and why it's important to have that, especially from an international perspective? Well, the, the, the basic premise is if you're trying to find a lost person, mm -hmm. there's no way of knowing where that exact person is going to be. Yeah. But what we want to do is try to match this search to as similar as this person will be. So I have 41 uh, different categories, uh, dementia, lost kids wow. by, by different ages, hikers, hunters. So you have, the, you have their activity. Then you also got to match the terrain. Mm. If you're conducting a search in Colorado, it's going to be very different than if you're conducting a search in K Kentucky, just, just because of the terrain uh, and, and the vegetation. And then is it a mountainous search? Is it a flat search? Or are you doing search uh, on water? And that, mm -hmm. that divvies uh, things up. Is it an urban search? Mm -hmm. Those need to be differentiated from wilderness and rural types of searches. And once you start cutting, you know, by 41 subject kites, four different types of ecoregions, population densities, yeah. uh, terrain, uh, your number of cases start getting smaller and smaller yeah. and smaller. So to have useful predictive data, the larger that the database, mm -hmm. uh, the, the better. Yeah. And we have some screenshots in our background that you can see sort of what the tool looks like. Um, and from what you're describing, so the app, a responder can input all of this information and really parse down into that guidance that says, okay, here's our recommendation or here's, you know, the resources you should start gathering immediately. So this is really, you know, user focused about how easy it is to put those different scenarios in. The, the, the whole idea was to go from the book, which is just chocked full of tables. <laughs> and, and tables and numbers I like, but I know not everybody else. Uh, likes that all you really have to do is say this is where the subject was last seen this is the type of subject with uh, the right mapping tools it already knows if it was mountainous or, or non-mountainous so you don't potentially have to even input those things and then immediately display mm -hmm. uh, in a, a map format instead of just numbers of here's the most likely place here's less likely places. We'll never be able to say, and here is the subject. Right. That we would call that a rescue instead of a search. Makes sense. Um, what kind of input did you get from the first responder community as you were building this app or as you were translating the information from the book into something that someone in the field could use? Uh, fortunately, I, I respond to searchers. So I, I have no problem uh, still relating to what searchers need. And I, I've talked to hundreds of other people because you know I certainly need to go beyond my, my input so certainly the easier it was to use uh, the, the better mm -hmm. uh, the goal was to develop tools that really need little to no training gotcha and I can add to that in that the group or the division I'm in in the first responder group is called our tech mm -hmm. and one of the things we always do with our projects is something called operational field assessments mm -hmm. and that's where we take these tools out into the field with volunteers who would yeah, and in this case search and rescue teams and have them use the tools and provide feedback we do have a second 100 second video I believe mm -hmm. on on this one of our search and rescue uh, exercises that we performed with Oregon and uh, so we do test out the tool with actual first responders absolutely and get their feedback that. it's very critical yeah, yeah we've actually used the, the find software mm. on four simulations already and we got four more uh, planned and, and that that's where we get just absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. feedback. So really getting continuous data, how this is being used, how we can keep improving it, right. you know, what else do you need? Right. Um, and that's a good reminder about the video. Folks, you can check out 
more information about the lost person behavior suite of tools and actually watch the 100 second video if you go to our website. The link is at the bottom of your screen. Um, and just a reminder, if you have questions, feel free to post them in the chat and we will get to them uh, as you type them in. Um, I want to ask about how, you know, how search and rescue operations currently happen, how this has maybe helped shape some of those efforts, and how you might see it evolve over the next few years. Um, so, you know, current state and what's possible with something like this. Current state is a pretty wide spectrum, mm. ranging from, I'm just going to use my gut instinct and sure. go, go look where I, I think I, I want to look, uh, to people who use more, you know, certainly use the book and use heuristics or rules of thumb. Mm -hmm. I, I like to call that reflex tasking, mm -hmm. and that's highly effective. To once when those reflex tasking doesn't work, you can use formal search theory. Most people don't use it because it does require you know, math and, and inputting stuff, and if you don't have a computer. Yeah. So it hasn't been easy to use up to this point. But from lots of other studies, we know when people implement search theory, they're going to be more successful. Wow. So it's really, it's having an impact. And we know that it's informed by responders. It's using technology that, you know, everyone's used to having a, a smartphone these days and inputting the data or inputting, you know, what they want. Um, so in that sense, it's really making something that's user focused, that's easy. Again, making sure that we have that timely information so they can make important decisions as soon as right. possible. And I think something that's uh, very clever um, in this software is that there's a lot of math, yes, going, mm -hmm. going on behind the scenes. But you don't, need, you don't need to concern yourself with that, right? right? Uh, there's a, a PSR or a uh, uh, probability probable, of uh, success, success rate. rate. Oh, wow. and it's a number. And okay. the larger the number, the higher the probability of finding the per it's that uh, finding the person it's that simple yeah so you don't have to worry about that magic math behind right. the scenes so it's, it's very user friendly we're hiding that behind the curtain we're hiding that behind <laughs> the curtain for sure excellent uh, we have a couple questions what is the name of the app and is it on ios or android the name of the app is lost person behavior and it is on both ios android and you could also get it from a, a, a blackberry store oh, as well. okay and it's free to use, or do you have to no, verify? No, it, it's, it's $10 gotcha. to, to download, but then there's gotcha. no updates. That The app itself, we push out new data to, mm. but once you've purchased it, yeah. you've purchased it. Okay. Um, and then is the app applicable in Canada as well as the U.S.? So the, the app itself, mm. uh, probably about 25% uh, of my, my book sales go, go to Canada. Mm -hmm. So certainly uh, Canadian resources have found that the information be hi hi highly useful. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Lost Person Behavior app mm -hmm. it can certainly be downloaded and is, you know, people are doing that all the time. Uh, the find software has to have some geographic information data behind it. Okay. So maps of the U.S. Mm -hmm. and where all the roads are in the U.S. and mm -hmm. where all the power lines and trails are in the U.S. So we're going to be rolling out the find uh, software for, for the U.S. first. Got it. And then in the future, I, I'm hoping to, to be able to get all that underlying data for, for Canada as mm -hmm. well. Got it. So there's more capabilities coming as this technology is, Absolutely. you know, tried and tested in the U.S. and then hopefully expanded out so our international partners can use it as well. Um, let's talk a little bit more about each tool. So the initial search response wheel, which we saw, um, which is a nice handy resource for folks to have on hand. Right. Um, and then we have the lost person behavior app, we have find, and we have SARCAT that you mentioned earlier. Can you tell me a little more about SARCAT? Sure, SARCAT, I mean, I, I like to think SARCAT collects the data that goes into the database. Okay. So SARCAT is a, a, f a free program that agencies can download to their own, own server, mm -hmm. so they're in charge of their own data. And then it collects it in a sort of a systematic format mm -hmm. that you know the user gets to decide, uh, do I want to make people give me 25 questions mm. or do I want to do the full 78 uh, questions? Wow. Uh, to, to the format, and then w they collect their own data, they can generate their own reports, okay. they can see their own statistics, then at the end of the year, 
that they can create a file that they can export and I can import into the ISRA database. Mm. And instead of me usually spending a week cleaning up the data yeah. and making sure there's no errors in the data, uh, if it's coming in through, through SARCAT, I can get in the database usually in like 20 minutes of yeah. just spot checking and making sure everything's okay. So making sure that that information that then goes on to the larger database is actually clean, ready to go. Yep. Excellent. Um, a couple more questions from Facebook. Is there a maritime element to the tool? Uh, right now, since there's maritime software already out there, mm. I, I'm not really developing a, a maritime mm -hmm. uh, element other than if you have a riverine environment, okay. uh, your search is just in a river. Uh, that's built into it, but in so far as open ocean, no. Got it. Okay. Will the find software mapping for the U.S. include Alaska? Uh, it will. Yay! B because all, all of those GIS um, layers mm -hmm. are, are available. And um, yeah, Alaska's part of the U.S. <laughs> all right. Um, and when will find be available? Uh, looking for a limited commercial rollout uh, two to four months from now. Okay which probably means four, four to eight months in reality, but right. my, my target is two to four months to have a, a limited commercial rollout, and then um, we'll be able to add additional states at mm. pretty much any time the demand is there. Gotcha, so stay tuned for more information about that. We'll absolutely be sure to tell you when that's available. Um, does the tool address the use of drones? Actually, it does. I, I received supplemental uh, funding from the Virginia Center for Innovative Technology mm. uh, to actually do, I, I call them UAVs, uh, but drone is fine, uh, research to get the, the science part mm -hmm. of a drone. And then once we have the science part of a drone down, then you input your... Um, uh, above ground level, how high you're, you're flying the thing, mm -hmm. what type of sensor you've actually put on it, whether it's uh, electro-optical, which is a fancy word for just a normal camera, or if you're flying it with infrared mm -hmm. or IR, and then what's the sensor like, what's the camera tilt like, uh, what speed are you actually flying it at, mm -hmm. how much uh, flight time you have. You can record the flight, and then when the, the drone has completed its mission, mm -hmm. uh, obviously if it's made the flight, nobody cares about search theory. <laughs> but if it, has made, if it hasn't made the flight, mm -hmm. then what was its probability of actually having hmm. detected the person? And you know, wh where should it go next? Yeah. So now we're, we're working on that. I'm interested, with all these in, you know, data inputs that you can have, what's sort of the minimum amount that people need to put in? in order uh, to be able to use the app? To use the app, you need to know the subject category. Mm -hmm. So are you looking for somebody with dementia? Are you looking for a hiker, hunter, child? If mm -hmm. it's a child, you know, put, put in the age uh, of the child. And you have to know where your search is starting. Okay. So we call that the, the initial planning point, mm -hmm. which, is, which is accomplished by taking a pin. You drop the pin on the map. Boom. Not a physical pin. Right. But you got to move your mouse. And you put that on the, ma the, the map. And that, that's it. Okay. Oh, if, if you have a direction of travel, hmm. you would have to input the, the direction of travel. Mm -hmm. That's good. So and, just and some the, basic and, info. And then the models automatically generate. The potential search areas are automatically generated. Wow. And then it's up to the, the user to decide where they're going to send their resources. Hmm. OK. Um, a few more questions from Facebook. Is it possible to get an extract of the ISRID database for Washington State, for example? Uh, it is. Uh, that's not part of my contract, but it's something I, I do in my, my, my free time. Mm. But uh, yes, I, I'm actually working with several academics, uh, several PhD uh, students mm -hmm. are, that are using it as part of their uh, project. But yeah. it's kind of, I squeeze it in my, my free time. <laughs> Got it. Um, do you know if the app is being used internationally? The Lost Person Behavior app has been downloaded to something like 20 countries. Wow. Uh, or, or so. What's the feedback like coming from international users? They, it's, it's their sort of go-to, check it uh, for every search, because it, it gives you just a really quick, what I call a tactical briefing. Mm. So for team leaders going out in the field, 
here's something just real quick everybody should know on your team. So, you know, if you're looking for somebody with dementia, hey, people with dementia like to go in thick brush or briars. Mm -hmm. So don't say nobody would go in there because mm -hmm. it's too thick. Mm -hmm. So that becomes an important place uh, to, to look. And then it has all the statistics and the behavioral questions. And then there's investigative questions. Mm. And then finally, initial reflex tasks. These are the things you should do at the beginning of the search. Yeah. So it just kind of is a nice checklist. Yeah. Excellent. Is this on blockchain? I don't know what a blockchain is. OK. <laughs> so we'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> um, we'll come back to that. Uh, maybe after the video. Um, is there an API that would allow integration of these great resources with other search and rescue deployment tools? Not not right now. Okay. It, and it wasn't part of the initial contract. Uh, however, it's kind of on my one, two, three year build out plan mm -hmm. uh, of a feature. I certainly want it to uh, be able to export, say, to Esri's uh, tools. Mm -hmm. I've had other people ask, could I export uh, to D4H? Could it ex so there's a lot of other commercial products yeah. I'm considering for, for the, the API. Okay. All right. So we'll come, we'll come back to that maybe in a few years. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Let's answer a few more from Facebook. As an LKP or PLS is established after the IPP was entered, is there a way to shift the start point or do you have to start over with the mission input? Uh, for people who are not familiar with all that stuff, <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, explain. So typically you, you start with an initi initial planning point mm -hmm. or IPP. IPPs can actually come in two flavors. One flavor is a last known position. Okay. So last known position, well actually we'll start with a PLS, place last seen. So the place last seen might be the residence mm -hmm. as the spouse saw the person leave in the vehicle. Probably not a good place to actually start a search from. Yeah. Uh, once you find the vehicle and the subject's not in the vehicle, you can say, well, you know, this vehicle, it's a known point. Right. So in this case, the vehicle parked at the trailhead is going to be our LKP, and mm -hmm. that's what we're going to use as our initial planning point, or IPP. Okay. Now you send, and that's what you would mark into find. Right. Because that's where the search is started. Mm -hmm. You send a team uh, down the trail, and two miles down the trail is a trail register. Mm -hmm. And you can see the subject has actually signed into the trail register, so that's a pretty good chance uh, they were actually there. Mm -hmm. So you can drop a new pin onto that that trail register and we would call that a revised LKP okay and the software will automatically without changing your mission or anything yeah. the software will automatically change the probability of area because now we have a direction of travel mm. and the circles will move from here to over there mm -hmm. so, so basically the answer the short answer is yes it can do that <laughs> without having to start a new search right. search over. You don't have to re-enter all that information. You can just keep updating the same right. search. Excellent. Um, could you explain in layman's terms how the tech automatically generates, specifically how it changes in remote areas? So how the tech automatically generates where the subject is most likely located? Um, I, I'm going to interpret it sure. that way. So once, once you know where the subject was last seen, our initial planning point, mm -hmm. and the type of subject it is, I have eight different models okay. that kind of explain. One is a ring model. Hey, most people are, you know, say 50% of the people are found one mile away. Mm -hmm. And 75% of the people are found two miles away. So basic rings. If we have a direction of travel, then, you know, most people are going to be found within that direction of travel. We have the probabilities of them going up or the probabilities of them going down. We have, if there's a linear feature, say a road or mm. trail or drainage, we have stats of how close to those linear features are they actually found. Wow. We have other stats. What's the chance of them being found in a residence? What's the chance of being found in the woods? What's the chance of being found um, on, on a road? Mm -hmm. So that would be a, a fine location model. 
We have a point model, so just what's the chance of being found 100 meters uh, from where they were last seen, and if they said they were going over here to their destination, what's the chance of being found within 100 meters? Mm -hmm. 100 meters, 100 yards, kind of the same things for people who don't like metric. Um, at least in SAR, it's close enough. <laughs> uh, 100 yards uh, of their destination, mm -hmm. the chance of being found in the same watershed or moving to. And then we just take all these various GIS layers yep. and we combine them all. Because a computer can combine them all really easily. Mm -hmm. Somebody trying to scribble on a map can't. Right. So, that's how it sort of decides uh, the probable locations. We also can input human input, which, okay. is, which is called a, in the SAR world, call, called a Matson process or a consensus process. So different search planners come together and say, hey, I think they're over here or this amount of chance over here. Mm -hmm. We integrate that information uh, as well. Okay. And then obviously you got to put a, a border on this. So I think that was the second part mm -hmm. of the, the question of mm -hmm. how do you automatically generate yeah. borders to your areas? Well, we use the various GIS layers. Okay. So roads, trails, railroads, mm -hmm. ridge lines, uh, drainages, uh, and then it, it, it just automatically draws its, its borders using those rules. And it's I think maybe the second part of that question asking about sort of the rural areas, this is something that do you need to be online? Do you need to have good service in order to use this app? Right. Uh, excellent uh, question. Uh, one of our, just being a SAR person, I go places cell phone service doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And talking to a lot of other folks, it's like cell phone service exists uh, on 50% of yeah. Uh, searches, even some of the more urban areas tend to have a couple of holes uh, here and there. So, so the way that the software works, it's on a USB stick. Okay. You plug it into your device, it fires up, it doesn't need to have an internet connection. You can still form a local network mm -hmm. if you have a router and everybody, you know, in view of the Wi-Fi signal, you can connect multiple devices. If you are able to establish an internet connection, mm -hmm. uh, then it can do a few more things. Okay. But the software can do everything in kind of standalone mode. It's just if it tries to talk to the outside world for enhanced fe uh, features, what would have to do Got that? It. So very important takeaway. This can work even without an internet connection. You know, speaking to those rescuers and those searchers who have to go out into, you know great portions of our, of our country that don't have cell service. Certainly. Um, we have another question. How do you confirm that people are, f uh, that persons found are those that are lost or missing? Well, th that's more of a tactical question. Hmm. That, that's the job of, of a, a search and rescue <laughs> uh, team. So certainly when every team goes out, hmm. they are given a subject information sheet, mm -hmm. which is something else we, we build into the software and will eventually uh, you know, deliver to your smartphone mm -hmm. through a Find mobile app. So you can have that subject information sheet. It has a picture, it has a name. Mm -hmm. So you can confirm that, yes, you've actually found uh, the right person if they're, they're unconscious and not able uh, to speak to you. All right. Um, a few more questions. Do you have any success stories? I probably get an email once a month about uh, I used your book, I used your information. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you did it. it was, the person was exactly where the book said they were. Wow. Um, and, you know, the book tells you it's a game of probability. Here's a likely place. Here's a less likely place. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I, I actually feel satisfied that um, I, I'm just helping people around, around the world all yeah. the time. That's wonderful. Did you decide to equally weigh all eight POA models, or did you weigh more than the others? Right now, they're equally weighed. Okay. In the future, I actually did design a, a tool called MapScore, hmm. so I can score each model to see which model is, is better than the other model. I can actually tell you the ring model scores a point eight, with like one being the best, and the watershed model scores a point three. But if you combine the two models together, you get a 0.85. Uh, so I will eventually weigh the models. Mm -hmm. I'm not there yet, yeah. but that is my goal, and I know it's an approach that will work. Okay. 
Could you st speak to the data being historical, how X number of people have behaved in the past versus using this data predictively? Uh, so obviously it's designed that past behavior is predicting future behavior. Right. Is future behavior changing any? Uh, a little bit. So actually, I, I certainly see among lost hikers and lost hunters and, and even lost mountain bikers who are out there with their cell phones, that if they get lost in the past, the, the vast majority of them went down. Mm -hmm. But we're starting to see an increase in, in the number uh, actually going up. Wow. Because they want to get a cell phone yeah. signal where one doesn't I exist. So it may be th in, in the future, uh, I'll you know, have something like, does the person have a cell phone? Mm. If the answer is yes, uh, then we tweak the up-down model to mm -hmm. account for that. So as we see these behaviors evolve or change over time, that's sort of features that will be tweaked in the, in the software. Yeah, w once I've nailed down the, the stats. Mm -hmm. Got it. How can we be notified when the apps are being released in the future? Uh, I find the moment I release it, everybody else puts it out on social media <laughs> and everybody know, seems to know about it within a day or two. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's my method. So a collection of maybe word of mouth, <laughs> but also some official announcements coming out. Um, and then Angela, does s and have any plans to fund development for more tools of this nature? So if we have a need, we have a continued need, and we have a budget, we have funding available, we will fund. Mm -hmm. So that part of my job uh, is to make sure, one, that DBS commercializes the, the products that they've been developing, mm -hmm. which they're doing and will continue to do. Uh, and then where else can we go with this? Yeah. Okay, where are some of the remaining holes and requirements and needs, and what can we do to address those? Mm -hmm. And do we have the budget to support it? Gotcha. So I'm always, I'm eyes and ears, um, and if anybody has suggestions about things they'd like to see uh, in this tool or improvements or enhancements or other applications that Bob uh, mentioned a few that he was looking at mm -hmm. from the three to five year time frame, if I hear from uh, customers, components, first responders, we really need that, yeah. then I put that on my list, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I keep, it, keep it there and make sure that if funding becomes available, we go for it. Yeah. So yes, there's always opportunity. Excellent. As long as there's budget. How does s and <laughs> learn about those gaps or those holes? Well, in the first responder group, we're a very unique group, I will say. Uh, we have a first responder resource group, which is actually a large group of first responders. From, in, with, from the United States, uh, all across EMT, law, firefighters, et cetera. And we gather annually and we talk about the requirements. Mm -hmm. So we break up into smaller groups, we define requirements from, from their perspective, right. they give us their requirements, we write statements of objectives around those requirements, and then we publish broad agency announcements for those that we have mm -hmm. the funding for, based on what budget we get. And what are broad agency announcements, in case anyone doesn't know? Uh, that's our way of announcing um, a particular requirement. Mm -hmm. we're, looking at, we're looking for you to develop a solution. So if you Google broad agency announcements, you'll, you, every, all uh, government agencies publish broad agencies announcements. And that's, that's how you get the word out about what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people like uh, Robert here respond with a proposal Got when it. within that time frame that's di dictated in the broad agency announcement. Mm -hmm. So we go right to the user community, the people who are saying we need this, we need something to help us do X or Y. That's in this right. case, we need help making sure that search and rescue operations are more effective. Yes. We need information. That's right. We take that information, we say, okay, here's what we think we need to achieve. Who can do this for us? Right. What yeah. innovators are out right. there? These are, the, these are the features we need. We publish them in these broad agency announcements. We take in proposals. We read them. Mm -hmm. we, yeah, we, uh, and then we select mm -hmm. if they're selectable. If they, if they appear to be able to develop a solution that will meet our needs. Right. Yeah. A few more questions from Facebook. What is the price of find? The price of fine has not been established yet. Okay. I, I certainly know it will have at least three tiers mm. uh, to it. And the first tier will be a, a standalone version 
that a search planner could use. It doesn't connect to other devices. Right. Uh, but, but that gets somebody able to extract some of the most useful uh, information out of it. That price point is, is, is aimed at something, uh, a, a small, a non-governmental organization mm -hmm. or a SAR team uh, could use. Uh, the next step up is the, the version that you can put as many devices as your, your router uh, will, will be able to hold. Mm -hmm. and there's only so many people on a search, and it is device uh, independent, so mm -hmm. somebody could have their smartphone, another person could have a, a laptop, another person could have an iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these would all work. And then the final version will, will be the enterprise, so it connects to the internet yeah. and has a server and remote planning and being notified of when team members are, are, are potentially in. So that, that's going to be the higher tier uh, version. But I haven't finished all my market research to know exactly where those price points are going to be. Okay. So we'll stay tuned for that. Can the app or find be integrated into other incident managed software platforms? Uh, right now, that almost kind of goes back to the question of developing APIs mm -hmm. so the information can be exchanged and pushed out or, or pulled in. So, you know, that was part of that one to three year yeah. uh, extra development lo looking at it. Okay. And someone is building a small search and rescue team. How and where can I get this app and the software? Uh, the, the appware is on you know the, the Apple iTunes Store or the Android uh, Play Store, and you just download it to, to your, your, your phone. So mm -hmm. that, that's ten dollars. Got it. So that, that's fairly st straightforward. The, the, the software hasn't been released. Uh, once it's released, I will most likely not only directly sell it off of my website, mm -hmm. but I'll be setting up distributors okay. uh, as well who can provide, you know, for, for people who want hands-on on yeah. training or okay. integrating with some of my, my other distributors or mm -hmm. some value-added uh, reselling there. Okay. Um, and has S&T transitioned to other technology or tools? Yes. <laughs> it's a big yes. <laughs> sure. Uh, I would suggest going to our website and, and learning about what we have. We've transitioned many technologies mm -hmm. and tools. Uh, and it's I, always ongoing. Absolutely always ongoing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a metric for us. Absolutely. Yeah. So always be checking our website for yes. the next big thing that's available to help you. Um, if there's no other questions, what's one thing you want to leave people with today about this app, these capabilities, you know, what should they expect or what do you want to leave people with? Don't jump at once. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I thought you'd do it from your perspective I, first. I, I, I'm thinking well, of, uh, of my perspective, but I'd rather end well, with that. So why don't you? <laughs> sure. Well, one thing is, you know, I've often asked, can you predict people's behavior? Mm. And the short answer is no. I cannot tell you where this one unique individual will actually be found. Mm -hmm. But, and this is a bizarre image, if you lost a hundred people just like this <laughs> and, and, and let them wander around mm -hmm. and see where they were all found, you get essentially a probability distribution. And you would find natural clusters. Mm -hmm. And so what the software allows you to do which is originally taking tables and charts, which were hard to visualize, yeah. is to bring it to life. And now you can visualize, here's a cluster along this stream, and here's another cluster over here. And since in search and rescue, you always have limited resources. Yeah. You just don't have enough. It's like, I got three teams I can send out into the field. Now you know. I send one team over here, and I send the second team over here, and I look to see where, where the next logical cluster uh, of probability is. And then you kind of roll the dice. Yeah. And most of the time it works, but you know, every so often you, you could roll seven ones in a row. Um, but over time, this is the key to being successful. And we know this approach works from mm -hmm. just numerous studies. Yeah. So from my perspective as a program manager, I have many projects that I manage. Mm -hmm. This is one of them. And the goal, for the success for me, 
is being able to come up with a solution or solutions or tools like you're hearing about here that make a difference, yeah. that can become available, that aren't just something that's going to be put on a shelf or some research that's going to be, you know, just put in a book, yeah. but actually these things transition into true products that make a difference for our customer or our components or our first responders. Mm -hmm. So the takeaway is, for me, it's, this is exciting because we're going to make a difference. There are improvements and efficiencies that will certainly result from all of this, and that is a win. That's great. That's a great note to end on. Um, thank you all so much. Um, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, we'll follow up on via text on the, the chat below. Um, but thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.